How are you guys doing today? Good? Are you sure? Everyone is good? I got to make sure everyone is good. How many first and second timers are here? First, second timers, third timers? Raise your hand. I want. Thank you for coming out. So uh, as you can tell, I am not Pastor Aaron. I am Brian Santos. And um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, but yeah, we just want to welcome you to church. And um, we hope and pray that this will be your home. And, um, and if it's not, it's OK. We just pray and hope that you leave out of here not the same way you came in. Um, and right now, I'm just going to pray um, before I start getting into the word. Because I need Jesus. I don't know about you guys, but I need Jesus. And, um, and I'm desperate for him. So Father God, I just pray at this moment in the name of Jesus, knowing and understanding that you are in control of everything, Father God. And I just pray that every word that comes out of my mouth will be able to just minister to the hearts that are here. And most importantly, to glorify you, Jesus. So I pray at this moment, knowing and understanding, God, that since you still speak, that the word of God isn't necessarily just a historic book, but it is living and powerful. It still speaks today. God, I just pray that you speak. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How many are excited to be in the house of God? Amen. So like I said, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Santos, and I'm actually one of the youth pastors here. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just here because um, Aaron is taking a break, which is definitely well needed, especially since he's the pastor. Also, he has six kids. And yeah, enough said. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I love Pastor Aaron. I actually want to thank him and, um, you know, just the elders here for giving me the opportunity to speak the word of God. It's funny, the first time I ever gave the word in this church, in my head, I'm like, man, these elders never heard me preach a word. I could say whatever I want. Um, not really. <laughs> but, you know, just the fact that they gave me the opportunity to share the word, man, it's, it's truly an honor to share the word of God. So, yeah. I'm excited for this word, and I pray and hope that you guys will leave out of here not the same way that you came in, because I believe that God guided your steps to be here this morning, whether you like it or not, whether you feel like he did or not, guess what? He did, and you are here today. You are trapped. You can't go anywhere, all right? And if you leave, we'll track you down. <laughs> Just kidding. But yeah, we love you, church, and thank you for this opportunity. So for those of you who have a Bible, or maybe a Bible app. And if you don't have a Bible or a Bible app, we'll have it up at the screen here. I'll be reading out of Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Anybody got Bibles? Anybody wants a Bible? Do we have physical Bibles by any chance? Anybody wants a Bible? You can raise your hand right where you're at. Nobody wants a Bible? That's okay. All right. So like I said last week, you know, um, it's crazy. This week passed by so fast. Anybody feels like that? Like this, man, I felt like yesterday I was up here. I was like, man, I got to prepare for the sermon. <laughs> um, but yeah, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. And if you want, you can take notes. It says, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little, a, a little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets, and he called them to come, too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. What a way to end the story, right? Leaving their father behind. If I was their dad, I was like, thank you. Yeah, all right, bye. You're not going to invite me? But to give you a little background of this story before I get into this, there was a guy named John the Baptist in the previous chapter, Chapter 3, 
where he says, I'm not the light. Don't look at me as if I'm the light. Don't look at me as if I'm the hope. No, I'm actually making a way for the light. I'm making a way for hope in Jesus Christ. So John the Baptist ends up making a way for Jesus, and not only that, but ends up baptizing Jesus to then end up being in the wilderness. Jesus being in the wilderness where he was tempted and tried close to the Jordan Valley. After the wilderness, Jesus begins to preach in the surrounding areas where eventually he encountered a fisherman where I am reading now. So, of course, I love giving facts because every time I read a story, yo, believe it or not, when I read the Bible, I sometimes read it as a soap opera. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. Like, whoa, I can't wait to the next chapters, you know? Like, you can't wait to walk in dead for the next season or... That's how I am with the Word of God. I'm like, oh my gosh, wait, you want to talk about drama? Read the Word of God. (laughs) That's drama right there. But to give you facts, fishermen, then as now, formed a distinct class. The the strenuousness of the work ruled out the weak and an indolent. If I didn't give the title of my message, I apologize. The title of my message is Follow Away. Thank you, Jared. I appreciate you. And who is it? Got you. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) So fishermen then as now formed a distinct class. The strenuousness of the work ruled out the weak and indolent. They were crude in manner, rough in speech, and in their treatment of others. James and John, before they became tempered by Jesus' influence, were nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. I wonder why. In other words, they were troublemakers. The fishermen's exposure to all kinds of of weather made them hardy and fearless. They were accustomed to hear, to, to bear with patience many trying circumstances. They often toiled for hours without success, yet were always ready to try once more. These fishermen, and to this day, it is actually one of the most overlooked jobs today. Being a fisherman at this time were the most probably despised. Nobody really cared about fishermen. That's what they did for a living. So what is a fisherman's job? What is a fisherman's job? To catch fish. Good job. So since it is one of the most overlooked things, one thing that people don't notice is that without these fishermen, a lot of times their families wouldn't be fed. So without them, there won't be any food on the table. See, Jesus called the disciples, which disciple means follower, believer, and learner. See, a lot of times when we think about follow, we see it as a negative thing. You know, you you always hear that, that quote where it says, be a leader, not a follower, right? You always hear that. And, and, and in a way, it's like, yeah, that's a good quote because of the fact that a lot of times us as people, we don't necessarily, you know, uh, you know we, we follow in bad intentions at times. Or if not, we just uh, we don't know where to run to. So we just go to wherever what's in front of us, especially teens nowadays, you know, get caught up in a lot of things. So when we think of following, automatically we think, man, it's better to be a leader. But in this context, Jesus is saying, hey, come follow me, and I'm going to show you how to be fishers of men, which I'll get into that in a little bit. Being a follower actually means being a supporter, defender, And when I think about defender, automatically I think of Peter. And servant. So for those of you who are taking notes, 
My first point in this message is Jesus calls the ordinary. In verse 18, Peter and Andrew throwing a net into the water for they fished for a living. This is all they knew. They left everything they knew. They left everything they knew. Do you understand that, that, that there was nothing they could, you know, uh, that they did outside of that? That was their routine every day, and they thought that that was their final destination. It's all they knew. They didn't know anything else. In verse 19, Jesus says, come, follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. What does that even mean, Jesus? I know how to fish for fish. What do you mean fish for people? But what I realized is that Jesus used a term that they would understand. But also his presence was felt. Thank you, Dina. They possibly did not know anything about following, but they followed anyway. Because all they knew was fishing. They didn't know what it was to follow and drop everything. But they followed anyway. I can imagine back in those days, and even till this day, there are people always standing up saying, hey, I'm the savior of the world. I'm that, that guy you've been waiting for. And at that time, I can imagine those people dying and not coming back to life. And those people that followed them were disappointed and I don't know if you guys heard a couple of years ago, this person was like, hey, May, on May something in 2000, whatever, Jesus is coming back. Hey, that 2000 something happened already. Where is Jesus? He hasn't come back, right? So there are many false prophets and teachers. So I can imagine the disciples at this moment, like, who is this guy that's calling us? But the fact that they left everything to me, was mind-boggling because of the fact that you don't know him. <laughs> you don't know the stranger. Why would you drop everything? Why am I yelling? I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question, right? <laughs> but I will teach you to be fishers of men. Jesus was basically saying, you have the equipment and the skills to catch the fish. Now I want you to know, to be equipped, I'm going to show you how to be equipped by the good news. I want you to know what it is to be equipped and to fish for people. In other words, reach out to people and not stay in the position you're in. Well, that's all you know? You know how to fish? All right, cool. I'm going to show you how to fish a different way that you don't know. That's good news. That's good news because the Savior of the world decided to approach them. My second point, which is first, what's my first point? Jesus calls the ordinary. My second point is Jesus calls the desperate. In verse 20, it says, and they left their nets and followed him. First of all, Jesus approached them, meaning they did not approach Jesus. Which is rare because for a rabbi or a teacher to do that is out of the ordinary. If you look at the next few verses after I think it's in verse 23 or 24, they call Jesus the rabbi. Why? Because he was teaching. So for a rabbi or a teacher to say, hey, I want you to follow me, that was out of the ordinary. That shouldn't be happening. And not only that, but why would you go to ordinary people, Jesus? If you're the savior of the world, if you're a rabbi, if you're the Messiah, why would you approach these disciples? Which they weren't disciples at the time because the disciple was a follower. Why would you go to the fishermen? These are questions that pop up into my head as I read this story. 
In verses 21 through 22, a little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, named Zebedee, repairing their nets, and he called them to come. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. You want to talk about desperate? It's these disciples right here. They were desperate for something. They were desperate for something new. You want to talk about desperate? They left their father. Why would you leave your father? I don't know. If I was the dad, I'm like, yo, once they come back, they're getting a spanking. They are going straight to their room. They are not coming out for a whole year. How would they leave me for a stranger like that? That's how I would have been as a father. Like, you, you don't leave me getting all emotional. Like, <laughs> why would you leave your dad? Why not invite him? It was an encounter. It was a lifetime opportunity for these disciples. See, it was a lifetime opportunity because of the fact that a rabbi approached them. A rabbi himself approached the ones that he wanted for them to follow him into greater things. So it wasn't just, hey, you follow me. It was actually an encounter. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, which is a German pastor and a theologian, says Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. Christianity without followers, in other words. This is what Jesus is, is displaying to these disciples. is hey, follow me, because while this world is saying that following is a negative thing, you're actually, I, I, I want you to see what it is to be a leader. In this context, he's trying to say, hey, if you become a follower, you just might become a leader. Which is the case. And this is my last point right here. The follow changed and changes lives. So the first point was? Jesus calls the ordinary. Second point was? Jesus calls the desperate. And the third point and last point is the follow changed and changes lives. It says, I, I, I found this, uh, this website where they were saying, you know, they were talking about this chapter, the, these verses specifically. And I love the fact that it says this. It says, Jesus' choice of his first disciples were surprising, to say the least. For starters, in that time, religious students chose their mentors, not vice versa. As the famous rabbi Gamaliel instructed, find a teacher and lose your ignorance. And that was the common practice of the time for those who wanted religious training. Jesus, however, turned that, uh, that custom on its head. Instead of waiting for followers to come to him, he went looking for them. Matthew reports that the first four people Jesus called to be his disciples were Peter, Andrew, James, and John, which we just read. Again, these were surprising choices. For starters, none of these four men were scholars. None were pursuing a rabbinical or priestly training. They were all working class guys, fishermen who expected to spend their lives on the sea. Wait, time out. 30 second time out. Coach, do you understand what, 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 what this is saying? They ain't have any training. A rabbi wasn't supposed to do that. He's not supposed to approach. Why he didn't go to Herod's court, which was down the block? Why he didn't go to, to where the chief priests were? Why he didn't go to the ones that supposedly got it all together? 
The ones have, the, who have a teaching degree. Those who are scholars, those who are theologians, why he didn't go to them? He went to ordinary people like you and I and decided to say, hey, you, follow me. I'm going to show you what the way really means. I'm going to show you what fishing really is. While this whole time you had this job, fishing, I'm going to show you that it's more about yourself. Because in reality, what they were fishing for was themselves. I'm going to show you that it's not only about you, it's about others. And because of one encounter, many encountered, as the worship team comes up, because of one encounter, these same disciples who encountered Jesus for themselves, because of one encounter, many encountered. Because of one follow, many follow. Isn't this what Altar Church is about? Isn't this what the church should be, always be about? Because when you follow Jesus, when you encounter Jesus for yourself, shouldn't there be a life-transforming thing where you can have no other choice but to share it with others? Jesus was basically saying, hey, disciples, you've been selfish for too long. Brian, you've been selfish for too long. It's no longer just about you. Let's make it about others. Let's talk about others. Let's talk to them. Do the same thing I did as I approached you. I approached you. You ain't approached me. Remember, you loved me. I loved you when you didn't love me. That's what I meant. I approached you when you were in your selfish ways. These same men. Listen, we're in Matthew. Now I'm going to advance it to, to Acts chapter 4, where it talks about these same men right here that I just spoke about. These ordinary men, these desperate men. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, says, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Who had been with Jesus. They encountered Jesus. See, what you don't know about this chapter is that they just healed a lame man. They just healed somebody. And the, the, the Pharisees at the time, the religious folks, the ones that thought they had it all together were like, well, I don't know what's going on here, but we encountered healing. And these are people that are ordinary. They don't have what I have. I can imagine them just thinking, they don't have the degree that I have. You know, they don't have the doctorate that I have. These are ordinary men. How dare they? But that's what desperate people do. They say, hey, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I want something new because I'm tired of this routine. I'm tired of just living. I'm just tired of just being in the same position for years. I want something more. I want something new. God, I'm desperate for you. And because I'm desperate for you, help me be more like you. And the disciples were so desperate that they actually became like Jesus. And just like last week when I, I basically said that love is a person. It's not just necessarily words. It's Jesus himself. The Bible doesn't say that God gives love. No, he says God is love. You can't separate it. 
So in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are His dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered Himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. The reality is that a lot of the times, as human beings, and I can imagine even the disciples themselves, we're following because of the fact that Jesus offered something. Sometimes we follow God because of what he offers. But what I love about this story is that Jesus was actually saying, hey, you might follow me for what I do, but you will eventually follow me for who I am. Mm. Mm. Eventually, you see who I am. You see the miracles I do. Guess who's the ones behind it? It's who I am. So they eventually followed him for who he was. And the crazy part is that a lot of the disciples didn't notice who he was until he was about to die. Or even after he died, they realized, wow, this was the son of God all along. Wow, it just hit you after he fed 5,000 people, after he just did a bunch of miracles. It just hit you? <laughs> it just hit you that this is the Son of God? This is the Messiah? He did all these miracles. And you're going to wait until he's dead to realize, wow, truly, this was the Son of God. Truly, this was the Messiah all along. The question today is, will we follow Will we see following as not a negative thing, but as something that can be a blessing to yourself and a blessing to others and a life-changing event for all of us? Are we as desperate as these disciples to encounter Jesus every day of our lives? Will we display his goodness even when we don't feel like it? Will we see the beauty of Jesus, of who he is, not necessarily for what he offers? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. I love what John Piper said. He says, The gospel is not a way to get people to heaven. It is a way to get people to God. That right there is a game changer. Jesus is calling us to himself. Will we follow? Will we be the ones to say, hey God, I don't know what to offer you. I might, you know, I look at my bank account and sometimes I'm like, God, please. I don't know what to do with my life, but God, I know you're in control. God, my family member is sick. They have cancer. I don't know what to do, but I want, I want to go to you, God. I'm desperate. God, I don't, know, I, I don't know what to do. I might become homeless, but I know who you are. I'm desperate for you, God. God, I don't know what's next. All I know is fishing. All I know is this routine. All I know is to go to work do my nine to five, get back home, and do what I got to do. That's all I know. God, I'm desperate for you. Will we follow? As ordinary people, will we be the ones to be desperate enough, not only for Jesus, but desperate enough to bring the kingdom of God here on earth in our communities? Because of one encounter, many encountered, Will we be like these disciples where a few years from now we got to say altered, decided to follow. And because of one follow, thousands of people started to follow. Because of one encounter, many will encounter. Listen, I'm not from around here. I'm, not, I, I'm from New York City, and to be honest, I came out here with a mission mentality. With a mentality that I was like, God, 
I'm here for you, nothing else. I can care less what people think, to be honest. Why? Because of the fact that I live for an audience of one. I live for you, Jesus. So in other words, if God called me out here, if God called me out here for a reason, hey, he's the reason. I'm going to do whatever it takes to fight for people's lives, no matter what. Just a couple of weeks ago, me and my dad spoke for the first time about something that was deep and intimate. For so many years, I had anger towards my dad because I was just like, man, he wasn't a real father. He wasn't a, a, a good guy. I never hated him, but I had anger towards him. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was so excited to go to New York. Why? Because I was, I, I was telling myself, I was like, you know what? I'm going to make the devil pay for everything he's ever done these past couple of years. For so many years, the devil has used a weapon, which is what? You and your dad will never have a, 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 a relationship that's restored. You and your dad will never have a relationship where it will be a threat to me. You always have that anger. I wrote a letter to my dad a couple of years ago, and I was like, man, I just want to let you know how I feel. Bam. I couldn't talk to him in person because I couldn't do it. But I wrote him a letter and I said, hey, this is how I feel. He texted me that same day. He said, hey, we will speak about it. Guess what? We never spoke about it. A couple of years later, which is now, a couple of weeks ago, he's, he told my sister, said, hey, um, we never spoke about that letter. And it brought me right back to that. I was like, whoa, that was a couple of years ago. When I would say a couple of years ago, I'll probably say like 2010. Seven years ago, I wrote this letter. And for him to bring it back, I was just like, wow. I realized that layers of hurt needs layers of love. Because they exposed the dark area in my life. And what did I do? I was excited because literally the moment he told my sister that, my sister called me and said, hey, that letter. And I was just like, oh, wow, okay. It's, it's exciting because in two weeks, I'm actually going to New York. And I'm going to talk to him. Two weeks later, I go to New York. I'm not even kidding. He comes out the room. And I'll never forget this, man. He comes out the room and he says, I want to show you something. He brings out a plastic bag. He takes out old pictures of me and him. He's carrying me. I'm like, come on, God, why would you do this to me? I didn't want to talk about that. I don't want to see that. But what really got me was he pulled out a picture of his mom. And he said, I miss her. And then he kisses the picture and puts it right back. I ran to the bathroom. I'm not even kidding. Yeah, I was out. I was out to the bathroom. And he was looking at me like, what's wrong with this guy? just running to the bathroom like that. I started to break down crying. Why? Because of the fact that I don't want that to happen to me. I can't wait for a funeral to happen in order for me to show my love to my dad. I want to be able to say that because of one encounter, because I was desperate for Jesus and because he chose me as an ordinary man, I want to be able to talk about forgiveness freely because I have been forgiven. I want to talk about God's love freely because I have been loved. And I tell you this much, that conversation changed our lives and changed our relationship. God is a God of restoration. God is a God that forgives. God is a God that chooses ordinary people like us so that other people will encounter Jesus. Because in reality, my father didn't feel at peace this whole time. I felt at peace when I wrote the letter because I did my part. And a lot of times as selfish people, we're like, I did my part, so I'm good. It's time to move on. But no, I realized that this message right here isn't necessarily for me, but it's actually for my dad too. And the moment we had the conversation, I felt like God was healing him and God was healing me. God was healing our, our relationship. I realized because of one encounter with Jesus, lives are being changed. So I'm out here on a mission to tell you guys and to tell anyone that I encounter that at the end of the day, it's not necessarily about me coming out here. 
I'm not a big deal. A lot of the times our preachings and the way we speak can be very overrated. But the Holy Spirit a lot of times could be underrated. Let us not focus on what Jesus offers. Let us not focus on what Jesus can do. But let us see who he is. Jesus is the Savior of the world. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes as I close. The reality is that a lot of times we come to church and we just see it as a normal routine, as just another Sunday, just another day. But what God is trying to tell us today is not just another day. It's actually a gift. And I pray and hope that you leave out of here not the same way you came in. God, I just pray at this moment, knowing and understanding that I'm an ordinary man. And because of your sacrifice, because of your love, because of you dying on the cross and resurrecting, I am able to encounter you, Jesus. I am able to see your goodness, your forgiveness. I am able to see you, Jesus. Help me to be so desperate for you that I have no other choice but to share it to others, God. So I pray in the name of Jesus that you just minister to our hearts that when we leave out of here, we will not forget this message. That there is power in your name. There is power in the good news. There is power in you, God. But power is only power if it's shared. And we thank you, God, for everything you're about to do in our lives as individuals. In Jesus' name. And as we worship one more time, I want you guys to stand up and we're going to worship. What a beautiful name it is. In Jesus' name. Death could not hold you. Amen, amen. How many can give it up to God? God? So before we leave, I just want to encourage you guys. We're always, every Sunday, we're going to have people on the side here. You know, don't hesitate if you need prayer. You know, we're here to pray for you. You know, um, don't hesitate. And um, we just want to thank you guys for coming out. And um, just be desperate for Jesus. That's all I can tell you in reality is that this life is hard, but Jesus overcame it. And that's, that's the important thing is that we can rely on him. So I want to encourage you guys to go out for some prayer. And we love you, church. I'll see you next week, all right?